Good evening, fellow councillors, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to tonight's meeting of Corporate Scrutiny, 8th of August 2023. The first item on our agenda is any apologies for absence. I believe we've had apologies from Councillor Bailey, Councillor Doyle and Councillor Coates. Do you have any further apologies? Okay, no. uh, just a reminder to all that this uh, meeting is being recorded this evening and will be uploaded to YouTube. Thank you. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 20th of June. Is it committee's wish that they are a correct record? Moved by Councillor Price, seconded by Councillor Bain. All those in favour? That's carried, thank you. Item three on our agenda is any declarations of interest. Excellent. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, item four is update from the chairman. Um, I've got no updates for this meeting, we're still early in the year. Uh, we are going to be having a discussion after this meeting about getting the working group on repairs going. Uh, other than that, I have uh, no other updates to give. Uh, item five is responses to reports of corporate scrutiny. Uh, we've got none at present. Item six, consideration of matters referred to corporate scrutiny committee from cabinet or council. Uh, we've had nothing referred to us by cabinet or council at present. Which takes us to item seven. Uh, members will be aware at our last meeting, uh, we reviewed the local ta council tax reduction scheme for 24-25 with its adjustments. And um, it was taken positively, but some questions were raised. We did say we'd quickly pop it on the agenda for this evening in case anybody wanted some more time with the report because the report was unfortunately delayed last time. So I'm happy to open the floor there if anybody has any follow-up on the uh, local council tax reduction scheme. Or unless Mr. Buckland wants to give us any updates. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Just to update on the questions we were asked the last time, uh, does the new scheme include the Armed Forces Covenant? Yes, it is. The intention is to continue with that. How many people are we helping with this scheme? That's over a 1,000 people. A 1,000 vulnerable residents in Tamworth will be assisting under this scheme. And also the third question was how many recipients currently in receipt of local council tax reduction between £6,000 and £16,000? Five are present of which <clears throat> we have a couple that will receive under the new scheme. It'll probably leave about one, one or two people that will be affected. So very minimal as far as we're concerned. If there's any other questions, happy to answer. Sorry, just quickly, just to remind us as well, there was a discretionary fund put in there for any transition to help people through any transition. Yes, Chair. That's very important that we do that. Okay, happen to open to the floor if anybody wants to follow up. Excellent. So we're all still comfortable to send the scheme out for consultation with the public, correct? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Buckland. Which point I'll take us to item eight on our agenda, which is the quarter one performance report. Uh, we have with us uh, a raft of officers and the leader of the council, Councillor Turner. Do you want to introduce us, Councillor Turner? Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as you can see, this is quite a hefty, hefty report, and I'm sure that you've all read it thoroughly. Um, uh, the purpose of the report uh, provides the committee with an overview of the Council's performance for the first quarter 23-24 um, financial year, which is April to June 23. Uh, the report... The, the, the reports... It reports the position in relation to the progress and the strategic corporate projects updates on the financial position, the corporate risk, audit and information, governance and complaints. Uh, the Cabinet will consider this report at the Cabinet meeting on the 31st of August. So the, it, the recommendation are that it is uh, for this committee to endorse its contents of the report and move it forward to cabinet at, you know, in, in due course. Any questions? Anything to add from an officer's perspective, Mr. Barrett? Yeah, I think it's um, important that this is a new style compared with previous reports that um, this, this committee received. It reflects the comments that were fed back from previous corporate scrutiny and cabinet to try and make it a more user friendly and b contain information that is perhaps more, more useful rather than, rather than being, uh, being anecdotal um, about the, the organisation's health. So um, we think this 
um, th this is what was asked for. Um, we, we hope it's it's more <coughs> user friendly. Um, Zoe, I know you, I think you've got some some comments about some perhaps some future um, changes which are, will be in the quarter two version. So um, we'll be further including in quarter two the um, additional corporate projects that have just um, commenced since April this year. And also we are going to include the new corporate risk uh, register, which we've been working with our insurer Zurich on. So we've had some, we've been doing workshops with our heads of service, corporate management team to look at um, the corporate risks um, with the changing global um, arena as well as um, the local and national. So um, that's going to be coming in quarter um, two. Further than that, we are continually going to develop this report also with um, scrutinous feedback because, um, you know, the more that if you want it, then we'll be able to report on it. So uh, we are going to be including KPIs. I know that was a previous um, discussion with scrutiny and there was going to be a working group previously, but we are still committed to look at KPIs but um, we do have, uh, there's a new um, government office called Offlog that's been set up and there may be um, KPIs that we have to report to them so those will be incorporated as well. Thank you Chair. Thank you Zoe. At which point I'm happy to open the floor to any questions or comments on the quarter one performance report. Councillor Bain. Yeah, it's, it's looking a more user-friendly document than it did previously. Um, the bits that I'm still unclear about are sort of benchmarking, because watching your own performance against what you've done previously is one thing. It's how you compare with other local authorities, similar authorities, that isn't clear to me. And I wondered if it's there somewhere and I'm just missing it, which is entirely possible. Uh, and the second bit that I wasn't clear about is we got targets and it's kind of where they came from and um, what is the origin of those what's the evidence base to say those are the right targets i suppose that's the bit i'm still a little bit unclear about i might just be missing it in the document Okay. In terms of um, benchmarking, um, we are that is something that we're going to be starting to put in to look at the family group of local authorities. So absolutely, it isn't it. You're not missing it. It's it's not in here. But we will be looking at key um, indicators that we can benchmark against other authorities. In terms of targets, could you be a little bit more specific? Um, which areas you were looking at the targets for, please? And while, while you're looking at that, the, uh, the benchmarking stuff, we use um, SIPFA for a lot of our um, benchmarking information, which we use as a sort of as, a, as an internal tool. But we get a, um, I think it's an annual report uh, in, in certain areas. Um, nice. So I'm sure that can be incorporated at the relevant time when we, uh, when we receive that. So as um, the committee can see where we sit within our family group. Um, of uh, like districts with, uh, with with housing stock. Uh, again, it's 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 quite difficult to, to make sure we're comparing apples with apples um, because we've got to make benchmarking is only valid if you're comparing exactly the same thing with an exactly the same authority. So it's more of a guide than a, than well you know you, know, you appear to be bottom quartile in this area or why are you top quartile in in that area. And again, our, our corporate priorities may actually also dictate that we, we spend more than, than others in, in one area. I mean, maybe community safety is probably um, a, a good one for that. We're very high performing in our community safety because as an organisation, we, 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 we prioritise it, we choose to do it. Um, we acknowledged we had issues with antisocial behaviour that we have addressed through putting more, uh, you know, more priorities into it, helping the vulnerable, etc. So, um, Benchmarking is great, but you have to take it in perspective with our with our corporate priorities, if, if that's helpful. Yes, thank you. I mean, I do understand that benchmarking has its limitations, um, but it is um, it is better than simply comparing your own past performance. I think it's more valuable than that. Um, the the bit of, uh, some of the ones I wasn't clear about. Um, I, I looked on sort of page eight and some of the graphs there. And there's a line about um, quarterly target and then quarterly performance varies a bit from that. And it's about, you know, does that mean that the, uh, the targets are wrong, the performance is wrong? I'm just wondering where the targets came from because I wasn't clear about that. And again, it may be in there somewhere. 
Yeah, I can pick that up. These are these these are internal targets based upon um, our pro, our internal profile of spend. So it it isn't um, this is anticipated how um, if you pick um, pick page seven and look at the top, uh, which is page twenty on on, on ModGov with the the top left hand, which is my area of spend. Um, I am marginally below spending where I, I was anticipated to be, which is which is, is the curve. Um, it's a very mechanistic way of showing whether we are on target in spending. Um, you know, looking at it, there's, there's, it's probably because I haven't asked somebody to raise an order in in one particular area for delivering something. Um, so it's it's more of a an internal check. Uh, against are we roughly spending to our anticipated profile um, so it's useful in that way um, but it's not the sort of the, the, the be all and end all that are, are, are we on target for year end spend but if we get to quarter three and all of a sudden you can see that we're, we're not spending that would also come out in the financial health check yeah. then that's when you know, questions can start to be asked about are we actually delivering what we're saying mm -hmm. we're delivering so I think it's it's uh, it's another way of, of visualising. You know, broadly, are are we in line with with where our, our spend should be at this point in time? So, but again, it's based upon what we anticipate it to be as to against the reality. So, if that if that it's makes guide, sense, the guide, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's, it's a guide, yeah. Um, and particularly when you look on page eight, which is page twenty one on ModGov at the top right. Which is the, um, the the assistant director of finance? That's all. Obviously, that's that's mainly income that's coming in. So that's a really important one to, to look at. Are we are we hitting the right notes um, there? It's amazing that accounts always show the income, don't they? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And at the moment, because it's it's it, it's it's missed the cycle, it doesn't doesn't appear on this. So that will appear on quarter two. So. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, because for, for you know, variations of performance against budget, whether they're positive or negative, are, are signals that you may need to look a bit more closely at that area of activity. I think it's useful from that perspective, but it's quite a blunt instrument. I agree with you. If I can come back, Chair, I think the um, the important bit to, to look at, which which answers your very question, is um, it's page thirty two. It's actually page forty five in ModGov, which gives our general fund main variances to date um, and then there are it, it, it shows you the position to date uh, year to date the variance to date and then at the uh, the very far right hand side of the um, the report it actually gives comments on the, the, the reasons why and that's that's the bit that I'd probably urge the committee to to, to, to look at and uh, and probably because it, this is the this is the reality um, if there's any big variances in there um, you know, it's, it's it's only right to be questioned, um, and particularly, I mean, I, I can I can pick one out at the moment where we're currently showing a, a fifty three thousand um, pound uh, underspend, which would, which which is to the good um, within our public spaces team. Now we know our public spaces team is stretched, so what, why is that happening? Does that mean we're not delivering? We've actually got four vacancies at the moment. So that's the impact of having four vacancies um, in in the first first quarter. So those vacancies are in the in the process of being filled. Um, so, but it, it just gives you a it gives you a trend and, a, and an, you know a, um, an almost quarter by quarter impact on where where we're at with um, with, with stuff with um, you know a, a valid comment as to as to why. So that's that's helpful. You happy, Chris? Anybody mind if I jump in? Okay, um, it's just a comment for a bit of tidying up for quarter two. It's not the end of the world, but I just thought I'd raise it. Obviously, you open this report online. Bottom of page one says page 13. The next page is page 14. Then it's page two, three, four, 10, 28, 30, 56. Clearly, this report's been mashed together from quite a few places because if you actually open it online, all the page numbers at the bottom go all over the place. So if I'm going to reference tonight a question to a page, you might have something completely different to me. There you go. Absolutely, Chair. Um, yeah. It just jumps all over the place. Okay. I mean, I, I, it just makes it hard to reference where I'm looking, that's all. Absolutely. One of the, um, what I've noted today, because of the ModGov numbering, 
um, there's two different numbers on the page. So for this report, when it comes to you, it's going to have the number in taken off, and it will just be the ModGov pages going forward. Like I say, not the end of the world. No, no, the absolutely right. right. No. It's a nice piece of work, isn't it? Yeah. Borough Council, where anybody who prints it is reading different numbers to anybody reading it online. It's just if we just clean that up, just be helpful. Hence, hence me saying it's pay so and so, yeah. mod gov pay such and such, because it, it does get um, yeah, confusing. Okay, looking at page 14, which is slash page two. Um, it says, obviously, we've responded to 145 freedom of information requests, which seems a phenomenal number. When I remember only a few years ago, we were lucky to see two a year. It just, I mean, what sort of drain is that? I mean, on capacity, 145 in just one quarter. That's actually reduced, Chair. Um, so the information governance team is a small team. To, um, so we've got three FTE within the team that, and the information governance manager also, as you know, is the monitoring officer so, and data protection officer, so very many duties. And they do respond to all of those. And as you can see, the percentages that within the time frame, the statutory time frame, phenomenal result for them. It just seems like a phenomenal number. Absolutely. Chair, if I can perhaps just bring you to the, the, there's some detail at um, at, at 6.2 on freedom of information, which is mod gov page 86, and that actually gives um, a full breakdown of uh, requests. It shows we've actually had a decrease of 9.93% 9 9 from previous years, um, and again, the freedom of information request, the hot topics we've had or uh, systems and, and software contracts where they're sort of asking us under freedom of information what do you use for x y and z so it's it's a way of exploiting our services for marketing purposes um property uh, community infrastructure levy charge schedules which is predominantly developers uh, and possibly other authorities trying to glean information from us and also business rates which is information that's harvested from a variety of, of um, businesses um, who are probably selling their services for uh, re yeah, re rent, rent re um, NNDR reductions and, and things like that. So it's, it's a very active area. Um, pleased to say that we've actually responded um, within the statutory requirement of 20 working days in 98.62% of the time, which is good performance, bearing, you know, bearing in mind the team is, is very small. Um, and the, uh, the responsible officer also has significant other responsibilities in the organisation uh, as, as well as this. So it's uh, all of the, say, the information around freedom of information and environmental information is quite, um, is, is quite good, quite, quite interesting. And so it's all detailed later in the report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I ask, please, uh, Tracy, that it's minuted that corporate scrutiny sends its thanks to the FOI team, um, because that is a phenomenal performance. It really, really is, given the demands on them. Thank you. Okay, uh, follow-up question, still on page two. Uh, neighbourhood service impact launch. What is it? It's the, um, that is the team that's been developed when we um, disbanded the wardens and so the team's um, now neighbourhood impact uh, service that's much wider than just um, the work that the community wardens did do. And what outcome are we chasing from this? That's a very, very good question. Um, they're, they're set up to um, actually dig into um, the more vulnerable of society we've got to actually try and um, give a more targeted approach to working with those people that need us rather than uh, previously the, the warden service was great it, it really served a purpose but it was very it wide tickets. it was very it was, it was scattergun um, you know yeah. it, it delivered services across everybody whereas now we realize that this needs to be targeted at those people who need us mm -hmm. rather than those people who want us yeah, and I think that's a very important and it, Perhaps goes back to some comments you've made previously, Chair, around around how we interact with with people who um, people who, who who think they want us, but actually we need to be getting to the people who need us, yeah. which is the um, the important part. So this is one one of the tools that we can uh, we can do that. Um, I mean, it's 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 a very new service, um, 
I think it's um, it needs to bed in, it needs to settle in, but it may it may be something that um, that, that the committee wants to review at a, a six a six or nine months point to, um, to 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 look at their performance. Have the outcomes been met? You know, it's um, it's a valuable service, something we didn't want to lose. So, we were. so can I can I assume from what you're saying we've moved away from well it's very old now the, the old locality model where we targeted in areas where we knew there was deprivation and vulnerability to actually targeting now more to the individual that needs us rather than saying we're in Stony Delft this week we're in Hamilton that week we're in Belgrave that week it's now more targeted to individuals rather than an area. Yeah, I think it's it's going to build on the um, the, the, the vulnerability data that we've we've started. Um, and the, the, the work that's been um, taken through the Shared Prosperity Fund. So we're actually starting to get to understand more about our, uh, our community. So, yeah, uh, it isn't an area that needs to be targeted potentially. It's a person or a group of people. So we need to make sure we, we're getting that right um, as, and, as and when we know about it. But I say it, it will evolve. It's a very, very new service, so I'm sure we'll be having very different conversations about it in in 12 months' time when it's uh, when they when they've learnt and uh, you know found found out a little bit more about what's uh, what you know what's what while they're doing it. Uh, thank you very much. That's staying on the same page, page two. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> Uh, conditions survey of housing and non-housing complete obviously <coughs> mentions there the high rise. Uh, Mr. Barrett will be aware because we've been doing this for a long time. We're always unsure at what state the high rise is going to be in every time we do a stock condition survey. And we always tell ourselves when it comes back that they're actually just okay, we always tell ourselves we got away with it. But we know at some point we've got to make a long term decision about the future of the high rise. Is this now flagging up anything that we really need to be concerned about with the high rise? I mean, we had problems with the shoots and the roofs last time. Is anything already kicking out that gives us pause and might maybe affect the 30 year HRA business plan? Um, I'm going to have to say I can't answer that. I don't know. I haven't read the report. Um, so it's probably something. If you want um, information, Don, I can get it. Um, I can get it presented um, by a quick briefing note. Um, yeah, I, so I haven't seen it myself yet, so I don't know um, whether it's in in a format for sharing or whether it's a format that's just come in. So um, you know, uh, but happy to take it away and, uh, and and let you know what's what's what with it. I'll stick an FOI. Yeah, it was, um, might be one that I was going to ask a little bit later, um, because it's it's said that the draft strategy has been completed for the the asset ma asset management uh, strategy, um, and that it's been done in draft form and it's ready to go to scrutiny. W would it not been more appropriate to get scrutiny in a, a draft base, because it also says that one of the risks is that if scrutiny do do come up with with something, then it's going to uh, do a backlog into cabinet so for me that's a bit of a you need to get it in a, a lower level before drafts are completed yeah i can give you a slight update there before i fetch in paul and andrew uh, it did come to corporate scrutiny last year and to be honest we pulled it apart a little bit at corporate scrutiny mm -hmm. certainly one of the issues i raised is how can you have an asset management strategy that doesn't mention the word depreciation at any given point it's just a nonsense we gave a, a lot of feedback at scrutiny which is why it went back to the draft stage to incorporate what we're doing but i don't know if there's any further tad there mr barrett i believe it's coming back to committee in september to scrutiny committee in september and september. then and we're going to ISAC. Right, must be going to ISAC then in September. Then it's off to uh, to cabinet post post that. I think is a timeline. There is a a more detailed. Here we go. Um, plan to take the. Uh, this is um, on page four, page seventeen of Mod Gov. It gives uh, something scrutiny asked for was a, an, an update on any red or amber projects, and it gives uh, as, as this is flagged as amber. Um, it's now the action plan is it's planned to take revised strategy to scrutiny in September. Uh, the updated document will take on board comments made at previous scrutiny committee meetings. Uh, progress on the cabinet for approval will depend on comments received from scrutiny. If agreed by scrutiny, the strategy document can go on to the forward plan for the next available cabinet. If further amendments are requested, there will be an impact on taking the document to cabinet. So it's, it's built into the plan for um, incorporation prior to go to, uh, to, to cabinet. So I, th I think that's sort of in, in line with, um, with, with the process we like to Thank you, Chair. Yes, it was something I was going to mention that it is a piece of work that's in process. 
and progress. Um, it's quite advanced and it will be coming to us all to discuss and probably amend or help and whatever we do with it. But it is, you know, it's, it's the two orange um, concerns. Are definitely, we know about it. We are focused on it. And, and it's, it's a work in progress, you know, the, the ideas are on it. Do you want to follow up, Dan? Yeah. Uh, just will the um, the condition reports be in that strategy? Because obviously there'll be a baseline for the strategy, won't there? Yeah. So yeah. That, yeah. Okay, anybody have any questions or comments, or am I all right to continue? Uh, Councillor Main. Yeah, I've been um, I've been working on definitions of impact for about ten years now with Warwickshire County Council. Um, and it now looks very different to the way it did 10 years ago. Um, so I'd be very happy to support any plans to, uh, to identify what short, medium and long-term impacts are and how they're different to outcomes and how they're different to outputs because that's a very complex area and essential. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm looking on uh, page four. And I'll be more than comfortable for Mr. Barrett to tell me, um, you know, I'll speak to you offline about this, but I was a little bit shocked to find it actually written in a public document. Response to Ankerside and operational preparedness. I think he's, um, is that something you want to speak to me offline about? But pr preferably, yes. Um, although, you know, I think you know, we, we have been talking around um, our commercial um, uh, property portfolio for some time and, you know, the impact of um, current conditions on our commercial portfolio and I think this is uh, is one that we're taking a much more close um, view of at the moment um, to try and make sure we're in a good place to uh, to, to manage anything that, um, that that transpires from it yeah I'll leave that one I'll talk, I'll talk to you offline about that one Andrew if that's all right uh, sticking on the same page exploration of a new operating model for services can you give us some background thoughts of what we see as a new operating model welcome the fact that we're looking at it because it's something I've been saying for a while you've got to redesign your services on a regular basis to meet current need so I just wonder what are we actually looking at it's it's literally still in scope uh, this is this is a, uh, a sort of a, a new corporate project um, hand in hand with our medium-term financial strategy we need to look at um, you know, review the way we're doing things. Is a more efficient way of dealing with doing things. Is a more effective way of doing things. So it's it's nothing new. Um, I think we've explored pretty much every um, every other way of doing things differently over the years. Uh, and this is just a uh, it, it puts it onto a radar, so as we can um, you know actually get a, get a plan to uh, prepare ourselves for the uh, for the future um, clearly it will be a matter that's of interest to uh, to scrutiny and to um, and, and, and to cabinet when the, when the plans are, have evolved if if indeed there's any mileage in doing it so you know it's a um, it's literally a this is a new um, piece of work that we uh, we need to undertake particularly given our um, you know the, the financial backdrop we have um, in the MTFS in, in in there you know we We've been very good over the years. We've maintained a uh, a year five deficit of around between the eight and ten million pounds every year. Every year. Um, sometimes it's been probably more more by luck than judgment because government have given a good grant settlement, which has helped us maintain it. Um, it's likely that we'll be in a similar position uh, this year. Uh, we've been advised it'll probably be a uh, you know um, a, a reasonable settlement. We never know until it lands. So it could be a case of famous last words, um, but yeah, we always we need to make sure we're in a position where we can plan for the worst, uh, expect the worst, and then and then yeah. come out still as a as a, as a robust organisation. We're, we're not unfortunately in the able as a, a private business to contract and expand to to suit market forces. There's certain things that we have to deliver, so we need to make sure that our uh, our, our sort of our, our base is stable. I'm glad you've taken us into that point because that was actually going to be my next question. Obviously, financial strategy to resolve the long-term MTFS position. I mean, obviously, read in the meat of the report, given that we're likely to have a general election next year, as in unlikely to be this year, 
I think there is a sort of a holding pattern with government on council financing at the minute. And, you know, the next government to resolve, whether that's some coalition, whether it's Conservative or it's Labour, it's for, you know, next year. So I note on there that certainly, you know, the um, anticipated fairer funding formula has been paused for a year, which every year they pause, it saves us £2 million. It's a wonderful thing. It's something, um, you recall, Andrew, that I took a real fight to the MP and to the Treasury about fairer funding. There's nothing fair about taking our funding to fund another council. Now, obviously, the game was started in 2013 where you were set a baseline for business rates and basically you had the old formula of we kept 40% of the business rates. But by the time you do top up and tariff, we were lucky to see 8% of the business rates collected in Tamworth. However, once you hit your baseline, call it £28 million for the sake of argument, you do actually then keep genuinely 40% over the baseline. However, they then take to, uh, half of that off you to give to other economic needs in the area. It gets very complicated, but that was the way we were supposed to finance ourselves back in 2013 was you grow your business rates, you keep the money. Government is now proposing longer term that actually they're going to take that off us to solve their adult social care needs. Now, I don't see what's fair about that. We pushed ourselves hard for 10 years to grow the economy in town, to grow business rates income. You know, the revenues team run by Mr. Buckland works hard to make sure we capture every penny we can in business rates and other revenue, just turn the government to turn up and say, actually, we're, sl we're slicing that off, you know. So it's something I, I certainly am I mean, keeping my mind for a long time. And it does, I genuinely believe if fairer funding never happened, we are not that far away from a balanced five year every year. Because that two million, give or take, every year adds up to your ten million. We're always talking we're adrift, but I'd certainly be interested in fetching that strategy when it starts to grow the legs. It is corporate scrutiny something I've been speaking to Democratic Services about. I'm not going to say we've pushed the problem or kicked the can down the street every year because the government were always changing what was going on and how we were funded and what we were expected to do, which always meant we had to wait for the next piece of government information for the next piece of government information, which means we've always had, as Andrew says, that eight to ten million at the end of year five, but we can balance the three year. What we sometimes forget as well, because we keep fixing it in year is, that's also underwritten by seven million pound of reserves, which in theory will eventually one day go. So it's not just an eight to 10 million, it's actually 17 million if you look to it more long term of how you resolve that reliance on those reserves that we never end up spending. Because, um, you know, on the 2nd of April, the 151 office has historically sent an email out saying, please stop spending money now, you know, when the budget's 24 hours old. And it's good financial control, utterly supportive, but eventually that's going to catch up on us. So I'd be very interested in seeing how this finance strategy kicks out. Have I spoken enough on this yet? <laughs> I think it's, um, do we know anything more than we did this time last year? No. no, we don't. Are there any government consultation documents out at the moment? No, there aren't. So There's many governments at the minute. There's... Um, I couldn't comment on that, um, but I think the, as, as far as uh, business rate retention and, and the future, um, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a key part of our funding strategy no problem. and it's, it could become a key problem. It could become a bonus, um, but it's, it's an area of unknown at this point in time. Um, last year, the, uh, the business rates pooling was, was maintained, which is great. Um, you know, Potentially, it may well be the same again this year, um, particularly given the, the, the scenario you've, you've just outlined. But it is an unknown, um, and it is a risk. Yeah. And again, we've acknowledged it's a risk, and um, you know we, we'll, we'll take it into account as we as we progress through the through the budget process and the medium term financial strategy. Uh, it is very difficult when you're trying to plan a business, having so many different areas of funding that are unknown. And I think that's the that, that's the, the beauty of, of local government is that we are, you know, we, we are we're not masters of our own destiny as far as funding is concerned, and we are at um, to a large extent at central government's control, uh, back and back and call by where that funding comes from. Uh, and you're right, yes, it's about two million pounds a year um, that we're either better off or worse off. And exactly. yeah. Uh, and you know, over the lifetime, it means we have been extremely well financially managed. Um, you know, to to maintain where we are. Mm, definitely. Um, it's just certainty would be lovely, one way or another, because if if we lose the money, then we know we have to cut a cloth accordingly, and you know, hopefully, looking at alternative operating models, different you know, different ways of doing things, we can accommodate that in in there. Uh, so yeah. It's just one of the many happy challenges we've got um, over the next, um, I would say over the next year, but I've probably been saying that for the last five years, that it's exactly the same. 
as, as, as we are. So, I've watched it for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, but I, th I think it's important. We've, you know, it's transparent. We're talking about it. So it isn't a surprise. And, you know, with, with that vein, I think it's, we're in a good place because we know, we know what we can do. We know what we can't do. So I think that's useful. And I think, like you say, the tragedy of local government sometimes is exactly that. Every time I felt we've got there and we've mastered it, the government throws another curveball in. I mean, I remember New Home's bonus was going to be our wonderful saviour if we met our local plan targets. We met our local plan targets and they started stripping out New Home's bonus. Then it was going to be business rates retention. And all of a sudden we're talking fairer funding, they're going to strip 2 million offers. Then it was 100% business rate retention. When it went through Parliament, all of a sudden it was 75%. I remember 2017 on paper, we had a seven year budget. And then the government released all its plans and we didn't have a seven year budget. And it just feels like every time we solve this problem, the government kicks something else our way. And it, it's just, you never seem to get that perfect position of going, here's where we are, we know where we are, because we just can't seem to ever grasp it because everything that runs that or forces that through is beyond our control. But yeah, I'll leave that one there for now. I've just got a couple more if nobody minds and then I'll happily cede the floor. Uh, I seem to ask this in uh, every uh, one of these meetings at the minute, but obviously I'm going to ask it again. I think it's on around page 12. Um, you know, on universal credit slash housing benefit payments, uh, we got 26 successful claims from 89 applied for, which to me said we granted 29.5% of applications. Yet in the previous year, over the same period, we granted 43 of 98, which was 43.9%. Now, every time I seem to look at this at a quarter report, the number of actually successful applicants, it keeps going down. And I just can't seem to ever get to the bottom of why does it keep going down? Hello. Uh, basically, it's the level of outside income. People are applying because it's general austerity. So when they are being signposted as to what's helps available, they are applying for a discretionary housing payment, but there is extremely strict criteria as to what we can award it against. So we are having to refuse them because when we compare an income and expenditure against their housing costs, they don't meet the criteria. So we're not saying that they're not having their own financial difficulties what we are saying is that we can't award it against rent. Any chance I can get a briefing note on that? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, one quickly for Mr Buckland, a figure I'd never quite realised until I read this report. I know it's been in other reports, but it never really quite clicked. Um, 5,134 caseload at the minute for council tax reduction scheme. Our council tax base is about 22,000, isn't it? So a quarter of the public are currently talking to us about, I just find that a really high figure. Absolutely, Chair. There's a lot of vulnerable people in Tamworth that need our help. Yeah. So, which uh, just takes me on to my last point. I think if you read this report and take the context out of it, it's telling the story of where Britain is at the minute and where the economy is and where Tamworth is at the minute. You know, you just pull out a few figures that I pulled out uh, yesterday. Uh, court income is up. We've uh, achieved 56k in court income against a target of 27k. That sounds wonderful, but what it meant is we've taken people to court that we're putting them into through some more hardship. And the new uh, local council tax reduction scheme is going to address some of that, but it shows there's a problem out there. Um, you know, that we've got 98 summonses compared to a couple of years ago, 62 in the same period for business rates. Um, universal credit uh, amongst our tenants has gone up uh, in a year from 46.9% on universal credit to 68.3% on universal credit. This report is really telling the story of some difficulties out there. And this is the argument I've been trying to have for you. We need to make the vulnerable in our society the utter priority of this council in everything we do. And that's, you know, I know I keep rattling on about it, but that's what I've been arguing for. But this report, and it's a great report, and really shows, shines a light on the issues that are out there in our society. It is showing the wrong direction for the residents of Tamworth. And we need as a council now to really start thinking, how can we help and how can we improve? And Mr Buckland's uh, council tax reduction scheme is a great start, but we need to find more ways to help and make the vulnerable our utter priority. That's just me on my soapbox and I'll leave it there. I welcome any comments back.
I, I, I don't. I, I don't think I can actually. I, I can. Um, I, I can comment back because you know it's one of our um, reasons for existing is is helping people that need help uh, in in a variety of formats. Uh, I think we were talking about the new neighbourhood impact service earlier, and I think that that's another example of we're trying to target the people that need us, not necessarily the people that want us. Um, the, the people that want us, I think, is going to increase because um, we've got you know uh, being the council. People are actually getting, you know, they're going to contact us and say, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, help. I, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've lost my job or whatever, or, you know, my hours have been cut. I'm struggling to pay my council tax. What do I do? And that immediate, that's sort of a contact with, uh, with, with, with Mike's team. And then there's a whole raft of things that can happen there. You know, there can be, um, you know, ways people can pay um, that's slightly, you know, perhaps slightly different than, than sending, them, sending them to court. You know, with, with an agreed payment plan. So there's lots of ways we can intervene that we do. And I think that's, you know, we are, we don't shout about it, but we are exceptionally good at helping people when they, when they ask for help. Um, I think what tends to happen is you don't hear about the people we're doing that for. You hear about the people who have ignored problems and they've welled up and they've welled up and then it becomes a real problem. And that's when it goes to court. Um, you know, so we, we do, you know, we, we actually urge people to, if they need assistance, they contact the relevant people in the organisation and, you know, and, and ask. And we can, you know, nine times out of ten, we can help. Um, it's very sad that some people have to end up with court action. Unfortunately, it's a fact of life. You have the people that, pe people that can, people that will, will, will work with you, unfortunately, the people that don't. Um, not quite that simple, but I think you get the gist. I absolutely agree, and I think it's something we need to remember as members and as a council that it's something that, you know, if you speak about adult social care budgets at a county level, you're talking, you know, 95% of spending goes on 5% of people. And there is a reality that of all levels of government. I mean, from my personal perspective, I do okay in life. I'm not a millionaire, but I do okay. I want my street lights to come on. I want my dust bin emptied. It'd be nice if they'd fix the pothole outside the front of my house. That's all I want local government to do for me because I don't need any of that support. But we know there's elements in our society of vulnerability that are taking a lot uh, of, of our effort and our resources because they need it. Whereas, you know, some of us in this room, we don't need that level. I don't need homelessness advice. You know, I don't need uh, uh, mental health checks. But, you know, there are those in society that do. And, you know, I think as a council, we're incredibly well placed to understand a lot of those problems and really target some resource. And we've learned so much over the years that I've seen. I mean, if you think about what Tamworth Borough Council does well, Somebody presents themselves at reception saying, I'm homeless, we hand them some keys to a council house for the sake of argument. Then we discover three months later they stood at reception again homeless because we didn't address the problem of why they were homeless in the first place, which might have been a mental health issue or a domestic abuse issue. And we've learned so much over the years, actually, if we focus our resources correctly to where the actual problem is, we tackle them. And I do think we're really good at that. And, you know, congratulations, Mr Barrett, on leading the team for so long in getting us to that point. So I'm done there, but I'm happy to open the floor to any questions or comments further. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of good work happening, um, but some of the work that we've been doing indicates very clearly that there is a stigma attached to seeking help that is not from the NHS. Because the NHS is very clear you've got bad health and you need support from the NHS. If you're seeking support from anywhere else, the feeling that people feed back to us is, I failed, and that I need somebody to bail me out. And social services face this as a, as a stigma issue all the time. And I think people do in seeking help for homelessness as well. They're feeling that I've actually failed in some way. And I think it's how we get past that. And, and the way in which we're looking to do it down in Warwickshire is to work with third sector partners and to work with community groups and to work with community leaders and faith leaders and others to try and say, let's take some of this stigma away. Let's make this a collective effort that we can all join. Because if we just say, we're going to, from on high, we're going to give you support because you need it, well, that will not get us past that stigma problem. The only thing that will get us past that stigma problem is genuine dialogue with people locally. But I, I think I'm probably teaching you to suck eggs a little bit there. I think it's a, it's a very slinky link into something I probably should have said earlier, so thank you for bringing it up. 
um, our new homeless, homelessness hub, which we are currently, uh, we're at tender stage, so um, I, I can't announce who the successful organisations will be, but it's likely it will be a collaboration of voluntary sector organisations within Stafford, so within Tamworth, to, who are going to deliver just that, a grassroots level service, mm -hmm. applying the right, um, the right services at the right time. So you, you're quite right. Um, it can take an awful lot for someone to come rattling on, 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 on the, the, the back door of Marmy House and say, I'm, I'm homeless, uh, particularly if they've never been in that scenario themselves. Um, our, our homelessness team, I must say, are excellent. I mean, I would say that anyway. But certainly, uh, you know, we, we have a very small homelessness um, problem in, in, in Tamworth. We're very fortunate. We, we're we're very blessed. Councils in the country, we, too. we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we spend quite a lot of money into homelessness prevention, which is, you know, it, it go back to our benchmarking. Our, our costs will be up here um, for, our, for our perceived problem, mm. but we don't have a problem, which I think is, is really positive. We do tend to have um, some homeless people who wish to remain homeless, which is, is, a, is, a, is a problem everywhere i mean i um when i go to sort of to meetings in, in in the county town if i go there early morning i'll sort of walk through the town and there'll be cardboard boxes and sleeping bags in in, in doorways and we don't have that here it's you know we are, it's, it's really good we're very proactive with it um and say the homelessness uh, hub is, is just an just another uh, i think another way of trying to even reduce the potential of homelessness in in people in a um, a friendly, informative environment. So hopefully it will address some of the the, the stigma problems. But you, you you bang on right. There, there is a, uh, a a real stigma with with people um, sometimes asking for help, um, particularly um, if they've never done it before. And I think that you know that's it, we've got to make it easy, but we've also got to make it. Um, the right advice for the, 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 the you know, for, for, for appropriate for the circumstances. Councillor Price. Thank you, Chair. Um, can we just take a minute to talk net zero and where we are with net zero uh, with regards to how are we embedding that within the the the, um, the, the council? The project says it's on track according to the the report, um, but the the first target the first benchmark was is 2030 which is about six and a half years away but on my rough calculations just um and I, I, we've not recruited anybody yet we've, we're struggling to recruit with it um we have now okay um so i just want to know well, where are we with it what are the plans with it how are we emb embedding that into the authority from um the big scale to just the small scale things things like uh, you know um the, there's nothing on the uh the email footers to say you know uh, aiming to achieve net zero carbon by 2030 um there's nothing to say on on emails to say do you really need to print this report um you know save save paper save the trees help us achieve all that kind of thing um you know, uh, how, how are we doing with that work? Where are we at with it? What are the plans? And, and, and do we think we can achieve that aspiration of 2030? Or or was it a foolish target in the first place that we, we're just not going to be able to achieve? I mean, for, for, first off, our target is 2050. And with, an aspiration. with an aspiration to achieve 2030, um, if financially um, viable. And I seem to remember a very lively debate in the chamber when that was um, that, that that was put in because it is 2030 will be a challenge. I think we we all appreciate that. Um, there is work in train. We have um, um, been informed actually today that we have just recruited a, um, a a climate change officer now, which um, yet has been a struggle um, getting a getting the right person and b getting getting somebody in post. Um, they're going to have a very challenging workload. We've got um, two strategies due at scrutiny before Christmas, I think, is the um, the, the, the the request and the, and the target. 
um, and that's going to give us a route map to um, to what we should be doing when we should be doing it. Is it financially affordable to do? I think that's going to be a real challenge, and I think everybody uh, everybody in local government actually mm -hmm. realises it's it's one of our biggies. Um, if we look at our um, our wide um, impact, you know, we're a housing authority. We've got four and a half thousand properties that need to be um, potentially upgraded. That's going to be really difficult to do in some cases. Um, some of our, our properties potentially may not be viable to be upgraded sufficiently. So we'll have to look at alternative mechanisms for those. That will then have a corresponding impact on mm -hmm. the HRA business plan. So you, 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 you're absolutely right. Is it, is it a concern? Yeah, I think, I think, it's, I think it, it should be a corporate concern. It's a very difficult agenda to, uh, to follow. And of course, there's so many unknowns. Um, what are we going to be doing for fuel post-2030? Um, I think 2030 is the last time we can install gas boilers into new installs in, in properties. What's, what's the alternative? Well, at the moment, it's air source heat pumps. Well, that uses electric. Can our tenants, can our vulnerable, afford to, use, afford to, to keep them turned on? A question mark. You know, there's, there's a whole lot of things that, yes, it will be picked up in, in the strategy, uh, that's the start of it. Um, we, we've, been, we've been doing lots of things for, for a long time. You know, I think we were one of the first authorities to actually use ultra-low sulphur diesel um, going back, dare I say, nearly 20 years. Um, we, 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 we paid a few pence a litre more to, to get that um, as a, st you know, a start to, uh, to climate change before it became the thing to do. Um, We've got the plans in place now for some of our EV charging points. Yep. Um, that's all, all embedded. We're just awaiting sort of installed times. We're awaiting a partial electric fleet, um, which is, yes, uh, I think, believe that's early part of next year, isn't it, from, from memory? So there's, there's lots of little things happening. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the big ticket items really are going to be around decarbonisation of, of, of council stock. Um, government policy because at the moment it's a little bit nebulous um, and also available infrastructure which is out with our, really out with our control so yes it's going to be it is going to be a challenge um, I think we've got we've got a grip on where we need to be um, the bit that we haven't got to yet is what does the bottom line look like because councillor Cook's comment earlier we should be looking after the vulnerable I would hate to be in, in the chamber with a decision, is it net zero or is it the vulnerable? That's a really, really difficult conversation Absolutely. to have. And it, and it is exactly where we'll, we'll, we'll end up. From the state, sustainability. Yeah. So, so hopefully um, there will be um, government intervention uh, and the realism that local authorities need um, adequate funding to actually care because it, it isn't just as we've done the easy bits you know we, we, we changed our office to LED lighting years ago because it, it actually reduced our costs we, yeah we, we, we didn't really do it on the basis of, um, of of cutting our carbon emissions we did it because it cost less to light um, and there was a really good payback we've done quite a few of our our own stock street lights to LEDs um, and it actually that became a self-funding it was a 40-year plan but it, it's self-funding because the energy savings actually um, you know, wipe out the capital expenditure. So lots of little things like that we, we're doing. So probably not shouting about it loud enough, but there's, there's, there's lots of stuff that is, is going on. But the biggie is strategy, the, um, the, the, the action plan, and then the cost of action plan. And I think that's then when we have other discussions when we get to, uh, to, to, to that point. But yeah, as, as far as trajectory is concerned, the 2050, it's a long way away. There's going to be a whole host of changes in technology in, in that time. Um, I mean, there was, was a very, um, I, I sadly watched on Catch Up the other night, a very interesting program around um, um, alternate forms of heating. Um, and they were talking about hydrogen. Um, the, uh, there's a, a representative from Caden to a, to a national pipeline yes, provider. 
and they, they were saying yeah, well, all of their, their new pipes now are, are plastic they've got plastic valves which are hydrogen uh, adaptable is it yeah is it you know that that could be their future they're looking at putting um, various sort of small conurbations as tests onto hydrogen uh, replacing their boilers and things like that and there's uproar in, in in that area because they don't want to be on hydrogen because it's highly explosive gas so, you know so there's there's loads and loads and loads of, of different things going on but there's no set technology that is the, the right thing to do um, air source heat pumps they're brilliant but they're not very good when it gets cold no. which sounds sounds silly but they, they require a lot of energy input to, to, to make them effective um, like wind turbines they turn them off when it's too windy yeah yeah so you know there's I think we, we are part of this solution but we're not the we're not the, the sole solution because it's it's bigger than just a um, a, a district council yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been on the uh, sustainable committee at staff at the leaders board and uh, this morning <clears throat> I was at the uh, Chamber of Commerce event which was all about where we're going with it um, and you're right there is no there's, there's no shiny bullet it's going to cost a lot of people a lot of money all of us if you want to do this um, and it's going to cost a lot of money for a long term um, it, it, it's challenging, you know, uh, when you look at the amount of power that's required in the grid now. And if we all go, you know, to green cars or electric cars, you're going to need a lot more. And so there is no easy fix, really. And I think you, you, you're right that it's, it's challenging. It's going to test us all. You know, some people are going to say, well, you know, could we put solar panels on every roof? Some you can, some you can't. Are you going to make your house green and, you know, cheap to run? Yes, we'll try and do the stock in, in, you know, but government's got to come to it. I was talking to some of the grant people this morning that, you know, EV charging or solar panels, and that grant money runs out in six months, which, which will make it more of a challenge to go down that route if you're looking at it financially. Yep. Just, um, just, just to give you a, a, a very quick statistic, uh, council operations, the percentage of Tamworth boroughs emissions are I think it's three percent mm. so we're, we're actually in control of a minuscule amount of of, of emissions in in Tamworth borough so as you can see we're, we're definitely we're only a, a very small part of the solution yeah um I, thank you for the the, the very detailed answer and I, and I agree we are only responsible for a very small part but I do think we've got a responsibility as an authority to work with businesses uh, in the borough um, to help them achieve their goals and their aspirations as well. Um, and, uh, and I think you're right when you, you talk about um, the, the technologies, there's no set technology to, route to go down at the minute. You know, everybody's going electric. Me personally, I don't think electric cars are the future. Um, I, I don't think the, the grid can sustain it. We, we, it the the infrastructure is not there and it's going to take years to get the infrastructure to where it needs to be for everybody to go electric. I th and I think there's there's better technologies out there. Hydrogen is is one um, and it's one that's being being trialled in other countries around the world. Australia have, uh, have, have already uh, started using hydrogen powered cars. Um, and, and there's other new technologies that are coming as well. And I think that the risk is, is that is that you put all your eggs into one basket and, and you know, the government want to get fully behind electric. And if it doesn't work, then in, in 20, 30 years down the road, we, we, we've gone down that road, but we can't sustain it. And then we've then got to invest in, in something else. Um, and, and it, it's, it's, it's worrying that, that nobody knows what the answer is, but we're still back in one technology uh, with regards to electric. You know, um, I was watching a program with, with, with my son the other day where we, we, um, they, they were talking about the national grid um, and, and what they're plugging into it. And you know, they're talking about wind turbines, uh, but it takes years to get the planning permission in place for a wind turbine for just one, one wind turbine, let alone a whole farm um, and the, they were talking about nuclear power stations and and how nuclear power stations are coming back and there's the big one down in uh, is it uh, bristol i think it was the hinkley point yeah uh, the big one at hinkley point and there's another one as well where they, they still not got the full planning permission for it and then they're talking about micro nuclear power stations um, which is something they want to do 
but the technology is not there yet. It's a, it's a completely new concept. But again, it's, it's something that they're they're fully backing, but they don't know how much it's going to cost. And and it, it it's just concerning that that you know as as um, not us as an authority, but as a country, we we don't really know where we want to be or where we want to go. Um, everybody's got different ideas, and nobody really knows how to get there. Um, and I think you're right. It, it is going to be diff difficult. It is going to be a challenge. Um, but I think it is just as important as the vulnerable people that we have got in Tamworth. And I w and like you say, I would hate to be at that point where we're going, is it net zero or, or is it, you know, helping the vulnerable? So I think it is something that we need to, as an authority, we need to keep focus on. And I think it's great to hear that we, we've now got um, somebody in post um, and that the work can start actually, uh, you know, moving forward at a pace because it feels like... I know you've just said there's loads of little things that have been happening, but we've not shouted about it. I, I'd like to see us shouting about some of the things that we're doing. Um, I'd like to see some of the reports coming through um, and 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 actually see that, that that focus is there because it's quite clear that it is there, but we don't necessarily know about it as members and members of the public don't necessarily know about it. And I think that's a shame because if we if we are doing these things and, and they are good things uh, and they are things that we, we should be shouting about, you know, um, and, we should be telling people that we are tr we are doing what we can do to future proof um, Tamworth for, for our children, certainly for my for my child. You know, um, so yeah, I think that's great. Great to hear, and thanks for the response. Thanks. From just a, just a, another sort of final final comment. Um, the one thing that we never link with climate change, we've got seven nature reserves in in Tamworth. Uh, we're, we're twelve square miles. We've got an absolute um, multitude of sort of rare species, um, insects, loads and loads of stuff that is actually vital as part of the whole climate change process. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, discussion around sort of rewilding and, and things like that. We've we've had a track record of where we've got a green space and we can do something with it. We've, we've, we've partnered with you know, the, the Staffs Wildlife Trust in, in the World About Tamworth project to actually uh, make the best of that. So that's it's really good and it's really positive. But what it does do, it means that instead of us starting with a with, with a base level up, sort of you know, sort of sort of here, we've we've got a base level up up here because we've already done so many bits and pieces. Um, and I, I think you're right. There's our, our role, we, we may actually be looking outside of Tamworth as ways of offsetting some of our own carbon emissions um, because that's the only way to do it. Does it help us here? No, it doesn't. It, it meets the target. And I would hate to think that we actually we have to be in a position where we're just meeting a target rather than actually making a difference. It's, it, it's a very, going to be a very difficult Surely. conversation over the next, uh, you know, sort of five to ten years I think because um, I do think it'll take that long to get some sort of uniformity um, ac across the country and good practice to come out there's there's loads of you know we are members of the the, the, the Staffordshire sustainability board through through the leaders board there's loads and loads of good work going on there um, because we've got so many diverse districts ar around Staffordshire um, one of our issues is we are the smallest we are uh, excluding Stoke the most urban so we have less opportunity to do some of the, the stuff that's happening in, in, in other places, mm. which is, is really difficult. Um, and that applies to like, network as well. So our, um, you know, we've got a lot of terraced streets, which is a very efficient way of, of, of housing people. People love them. Really difficult when it comes to putting electric charging points in. Um, mm. Yeah, and again, and, you know, and that is, that's some of the, Fairly simple challenges that um, that, that we we and and our county colleagues are going to have to uh, to, to address. Because obviously, uh, on street areas are county council um, to, uh, to to sort of help. So yeah, and I think there's a report uh, coming on that again. I think that's just prior to uh, to, to, to Christmas. Mm -hmm. So uh, trying to adopt the same um, the, the same measures as as county colleagues are doing, which is good. I'll just quickly, Council Price, tell you an amusing one. Uh, Mr Barrett will remember that in 2009, the Council had its environmental peer assessment through the old um, CPA regime. 
Um, I was actually asked at the time, what's the council doing to re reduce emissions? I said, well, how do you mean? They said, do you encourage your staff to take public transport? I said, yes, we do. Well, how do you do that? I said, we don't give them anywhere to park. I was making a joke and they marked us up for it, didn't they? <laughs> but the, re the reason I mention that is just take a look at the decision we took in the last couple of years to you know, send our staff to work from home. That actually has an impact because it's fewer journeys. And it is, it's grabbing little pieces where we can, but you're absolutely correct. We're never going to make 2030. It's, it was an aspiration and you're absolutely right to raise it. Do you have any more comments on the quarterly performance report? If that's the case, I'm happy to move the recommendation that we endorse this and send it off to Paul's committee, i.e. cabinet. Uh, seconded by Councillor Price. All those in favour? That is carried. Uh, can I thank officers, guests for their attendance and preparation of this report? I have to say that because Tracy's wrote it on my briefing note. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, any, anybody's welcome to stay. There's not really much left on the journey, but you're welcome to stay. Or if you want a moment to shuffle out and uh, go see your families and have some dinner, carry on. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>